uh, Dick Edal. Uh, we're doing videos on my cars. We've done one previously on my XK120 Jaguar, and today we're doing it on the on my E-Type. Uh, why are we doing this? Very good question. I'm not absolutely sure why that is. Uh, I'm not particularly special myself. My cars are more special to me than anybody else. However, I know that Dick has got the Cecil B. DeMille envy, and he considers himself a cinematographer, a producer of videos, and a director. So my director has insisted that we do videos on my cars, and here we are uh, talking about the, the Jaguar E-types. Uh, I have got interest in a lot of cars. All cars are interesting to me, but I've been particularly fond of Jaguars. They're going way back. I've had a total of uh, eight XK120s that I've owned and uh, four E-types. The, uh, eight XK, the eight XK120s, uh, uh, my first one was a 1954 uh, fixed head coupe, which I bought when I was in the service uh, over uh, in Paris and drove that uh, around Europe. I left it there when I rotated and uh, bought a number of others when I came back to uh, California, including uh, an alloy uh, 120, uh, number 24 left hand drive out of that 242 original pre-production cars. So I've had a number of those. Uh, on the uh, E-types, I've had uh, four of those, two coupes and, and two uh, uh, roadsters, or as the English call them, open two-seaters. And uh, my first one was a coupe, it was a 1962 um, uh, coupe, which I bought in uh, 1969. Uh, my wife Kathy also had a coupe, a 1970 uh, E-Type, which she drove uh, uh, in the uh, mid to late 70s. Uh, that was her everyday car. She enjoyed the, the heck out of it in the favorite car. And uh, unfortunately, it came at a time when our son was ready to have uh, his first car, and we felt uh, that we should maybe uh, step up and, and buy him his first car since the ones he wanted to get uh, were probably going to break down every time he got into it. <laughs> so we, we decided to uh, sell the E-Type and uh, use the money to buy him a, a used 81 Chevrolet Citation X11. So when I look back on that, I uh, sort of cringe a little bit because I think of what the value of that uh, 70 E-Type Coupe would be worth today compared to uh, the uh, 81 Citation X11. But in all fairness, the, those Citation X11s are relatively rare today since most of them have uh, been turned into scrap metal, yeah. which um, essentially is worth more than the cars are today. At any rate, uh, those are the uh, couple of the E-types that uh, we've owned and uh, uh, eventually we uh, went on and, and uh, I wound up with this particular one. Okay, and now, I have a pet peeve when it comes to these cars. And uh, Dick, if I could have you do a close-up of the script on the, on the trunk here, you'll see it says uh, E-Type Jaguar 4.2. Now, nowhere on this car does it say XKE, and that's one of my pet peeves. The correct name is E-Type not XKE, and I feel obligated to give you a little background on why it's an E-Type and not an XKE. Go back a little ways to when the XK120s first came out, and Jaguar felt uh, a need to uh, race at Le Mans because it was such a prestigious race and it uh, proved uh, the cars that uh, did well there usually were uh, an indication of the fact that they were reliable and good cars. So they, they wanted to uh, run their cars at the Mons. And uh, so they took their XK120 in 1950 and uh, modified one uh, to be a race car that could be run at Le Mans for the 24 hours. Basically, 
what they did is they uh, kept the mechanical but put a different body on it, made it a lightweight tube frame type of car, a, a true competition car, and it was called the SK120C, C for competition. But in short order, they just changed that name to C-Type. And the C-Type raced at Le Mans in 51. It actually won there, did an average uh, uh, time of uh, 93 miles an hour, I think, for the, for the full 24 hours. They also raced a, a stock 120 and basically racing trim. Um, that car, I had mentioned it when we did the video on my 120, and uh, I'm ad-libbing all this, so I have to go back because I viewed the 120 tape and I saw that in my ad-lib I got something not quite right. I mentioned that the, uh, the uh, stock 120 in 51 came in 11th and uh, it uh, lapped at 132. Well, that's true, except I said miles per hour and I meant to say kilometers per hour, which is quite a bit different. It's uh, actually 82 miles per hour when you convert that. So I wanted to uh, correct that. They also ran the C-Type uh, in 52. Uh, Mercedes was quite fast at that time and Jaguar factory got a little bit uh, shook up at uh, how fast the Mercedes was were, so they made a slight modification to the C-types. They modified the front end, made it a little more aerodynamic, and it uh, was disastrous because it restricted the airflow to the radiator, the cars overheated. In hindsight, it turns out that uh, the times that they uh, achieved uh, the year before in 51 would have been sufficient to again win in 52. So they went back to the original body style in 53, and uh, they won again in 53. Uh, they did an average speed for the 24 hours of 105 miles an hour, which was the first car ever to exceed over 100 miles an hour for the uh, 24 hours of Le Mans. They also were able to win because they had a new addition, a uh, new item on their car, which was the first time any racing car ever had that, and that was disc brakes. They were the first to include disc brakes on their cars. They developed that car into the next uh, competition car. Uh, they called it the D-Type. I suspect it was the D-Type because D came after C. At any rate, uh, they raced those cars again at Le Mans and elsewhere, and uh, they did exceptionally well. Well, they won overall at Le Mans in 55, 56, and 57. By that time, they were getting a little bit uh, uh, old as far as competition cars, so uh, Jaguar decided to uh, take him out of competition. And uh, But they were also getting to the point where they needed a new uh, sports car. So they had a stock of these D-types at the factory, and what they decided to do was very simple. They kept the D-type mechanically in the car exactly as it was. They put a windshield on it. They put a luggage rack on the trunk, since there was really no trunk space, and they put bumpers on it. They gave it a new name, XKSS, and they sold those as their new uh, production car for sports cars. But it didn't get very far. They built 16 of them, and uh, unfortunately the factory uh, burnt down, and it, uh, in the fire they lost all of the remaining D-types. So that was the end of that program. But, come uh, 1959, they uh, decided to, in earnest, build a new sports car. And uh, because the older sports cars, the SK120, 140, and 150, SK150, needed a replacement. So in 59, they decided, let's take the, what we learned in the C-type and the D-type competition cars, and let's evolve that into another car that can be dual purpose, be a good competition car, and also uh, a street car that we could sell as the next sports car. And they called that one the E-Type. And uh, that's how that name uh, came about. They did also build some lightweight uh, versions of that car in 1963 and 64 that were quite successful as competition cars. But in late 61, they introduced the E-Type. In 62, Enzo Ferrari uh, made the statement that he thought it was the most beautiful car ever produced and possibly in 1962 compared to other cars being built at that time 
that may have been a, an accurate statement. The uh, Jaguar E-Type and the previous Jaguars were uh, considered beautiful because beauty was represented uh, by curves in a car. Unlike today when cars are designed with uh, a lot of sharp angles. The uh, E-Type was beautiful because of its curves and is iconic as a result and is still considered beautiful today. When it was introduced uh, in 1961 and early 1962 in the United States, American car magazines featured the E-Type uh, on its cover and then with articles, but they referred to the car as an XKE, possibly because easier to spell XKE than, than E-Type, but more likely because uh, it came right after the XK120, XK140, and XK150. Regardless, the public, American public, accepted that as the name of the, uh, the new Jaguar, even though it was totally incorrect. In fact, even uh, Jan and Dean and their song, Dead Man's Curve, sang about the, uh, the uh, Corvette Stingray and the Jaguar XKE. Of course, that's all incorrect, but uh, that's hindsight. People still call it XKE, even though it's completely incorrect. The correct name is as it was branded by a Jaguar, which is E-Type, period. Again, the uh, Jaguar E-Type was uh, introduced in late 61, and over time, uh, they made uh, uh, three different series of these cars, uh, starting uh, with its introduction essentially in, in 62, as a series one that ran through uh, 1967, and then in late 68 uh, through 1970 was a series two, and 71 to 75 was a series three which was a V12 uh, uh, engine car versus the prior SK engine cars. Uh, this particular car that I own is a 68 and it's referred to as a series one and a half. Essentially, it was an interim car between the series one and series two and the result of US safety standards that require changes to the cars uh, that were brought into this country. So this interim car was incorporated some of those changes. And uh, I'll go over some of those with you. And uh, I essentially, uh, I bought this one here in uh, August of uh, 1971. This uh, specific car, this particular car was built in November of 1967. And it was shipped to uh, Escondido, California in uh, January of 68 again as a series one and a half. So let me go over some of the things that uh, were different on the, uh, these early uh, interim cars that were different from the series one cars. The uh, safety standards, US safety standards, made it illegal to have covered headlights. So the plexiglass cover was removed from these cars. I have purchased these extremely rare stone guards which were available for a brief period when I bought the car, but uh, you can find them now if you wanted to. They're scarce as hen's teeth, and uh, I used them in place of the uh, plexiglass uh, covers. Uh, the, the other thing that's unique to the, this particular car is the uh, chrome piece uh, behind the headlight, because with the Series 2 coming in the basically 69, the headlights were a little farther forward, which meant a bigger chrome piece back here. So this is very unique to the uh, one and a half cars. Uh, I didn't care for the overriders that they had on these cars, so I removed those myself and, and kept it uh, a more uh, better looking, in my opinion, uh, front bumper. This car originally was opalescent maroon and it had a white vinyl roof, and the interior was what they call beige, but essentially it was a white interior. And uh, I didn't care for that uh, color combination. And when I bought the car in uh, short order, uh, being that I worked at Chevrolet Motor Division, I had access to all the color chips that Chevrolet could use on anyone that, that wanted a, a special color. 
for one of their Chevrolets that they had ordered. Included in those color chips was about a dozen yellows. And I picked out the yellow that I thought, in my opinion, looked closest to Ferrari Fly Yellow. And that's what I had the car painted, this Ferrari Fly Yellow. I also changed the interior from the, uh, basically, like I said, white. And uh, I dyed, uh, dyed it myself to a Jaguar Cinnamon instead. Uh, the other thing that I did was, if you look at the rear view mirror on this, originally the stock rear view mirror was uh, actually glued to the windshield and not, uh, not movable. But on the Series 1 cars, it was attached to the stock uh, that you see there and could be adjusted. So again, I converted that to uh, how it was done uh, originally. Uh, the other things I, I changes I made to this car were the wheels. And if you look at the, at the wheels, you'll notice that the uh, knockoff has ears on it. Again, the U.S. safety standard made the ears illegal. So you had a knockoff with no ears, which meant you had to have an adapter to actually be able to take it on and off. But So I put on the earlier ear knockoffs on it. I also replaced the wheel itself. They were five inch wide and the uh, tires weren't very wide. If you look at the uh, width of the tires on my 120 here, you'll see the uh, E-Type was actually only slightly wider than these. And with the wider wheels, six inch wide wheels that I made a change on this car, I was able to uh, go ahead and put bigger tires as well, which uh, helped it perform a little bit better. The, uh, the top originally was a white final top, and I changed that to a cloth uh, tan top and uh, made those changes. Now, as I said, this was a car that was shipped to California. California, even back in the, in the uh, 60s, had uh, emissions that were fairly strict. So I had to make some changes to those. Let me open up the hood, and I'll show you what I did there. <laughs> The uh, smog equipment on this car, which was quite a bit of it, but the main thing they had going, which was kind of disgusting in my opinion, you'll see these notches here on the cam covers. They had a uh, pipe that went from a different uh, exhaust manifold, I had to replace it, but it was attached to the exhaust manifold, went across the top and took those wonderful exhaust gases and put them into the car, back into the uh, intake side of the uh, the engine so that they could be recirculated uh, through again. Wonderful uh, smog device. Also the carburetors were twin Strombergs which uh, diminished the horsepower in this car by quite a bit. So those went in the trash also and I replaced it with the what the Series 1 had which was the triple SUs as you see here. So essentially what I did is I converted this car from a one and a half to a, uh, a Series one car and uh, essentially changed it from a 68 to a 67. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it was what I wanted to do and I think it, it worked quite well. The other thing that's pretty rare about this car is that it came on a hard top, not just a hard top, a factory hard top. Extremely rare. A number of these cars have hard tops, but the factory built hard top is again a very, very rare item and uh, very fortunate to have uh, one that uh, came with, uh, with my E-Type. I made a number of changes to these cars and converted it from a 68 to a 67. Um, today, the value of a uh, E-Type like this, if it's meticulously restored, and uh, well documented, it can bring an excess of uh, 200,000. With the changes that were made, if my name was Steve McQueen, this probably would be the most valuable E type on the planet. But I'm not Steve McQueen. And the changes I made, being that I'm really a nobody, uh, probably devalued this car somewhat. Well, I shouldn't say I'm a nobody. After all, I did write a book. I've been involved with a lot of cars, so I wrote a book about my car experiences. It's called Lobsters in the Snow. You can Google that, find out more about it. 
It uh, tells about my 30 year experiences at Chevrolet Motor Division as a Chevrolet's merchandising manager and uh, also uh, my experiences in motorsports, which were mostly uh, in the Trans Am series and the IndyCar series. Uh, if you find any of this adventurous, I would just strongly recommend you take a look at this book. Thank you.